The desire not to be anything is the desire not to be. This is a um, quote, President, quote, Xi Jinping of China. This man with his handout is our president, Joseph Biden. Last week, they met, they shook hands, they smiled, turned to the camera. And later in this video, which I'm not going to play, he's talking about what they talked about. Why did this happen? You can't imagine Franklin Delano Roosevelt going to Nazi Germany and shaking the hand of Hitler. I'm not a fan of FDR, but that wouldn't have happened. Why can the equivalent happen today? President, in quote, Xi is the dictator of China. His role in life is to kill, imprison, enslave. There are, according to one a news service I looked at on the web, one million Uyghurs in detention now, and I'm sure many of them have died. And the nature of a dictatorship is, in the words of Ayn Rand's hero Kira Argunova in We the Living, to forbid life to the living. So what made Biden shake his hand? If we lived in different times, any president who did that would be impeached and he would know he would be impeached, so he would never do it. And it's not just Biden. Do you remember when George W. Bush said, I met with Putin, I looked into his eyes and I saw deep into his soul and he's a good man. Do you remember that? I do. What about Nixon? Nixon, who began as an anti-communist, did the China opening, the Shanghai gesture. He went and met with the, the real dictators of China, the real murderers. The, I mean, the murderers on a scale way past uh, Xi Jinping. What about the whole idea of the UN? Let's have world peace by including Soviet Russia and Red China. Uh, originally, they didn't include Red China, but it was Free China as members. Let's, let's include everybody and bring them in to talk. What about Woodrow Wilson before that with the League of Nations? We're going to prevent war by having everybody sit down and talk. Talking brings understanding. Understanding means peace. Remember the slogan, when people are talking, they're not shooting. Well, it's not true. Maybe they're not shooting, but their troops are shooting. Diplomacy, talks, building bridges. That was uh, the, I think, Nixon's. Uh, slogan in the 60s, let's build bridges, and the left picked it up and loved it. Detente, release of tension. What, what's behind all this idea of talks? Why do people, no matter how many times they fail, and they fail every single time, every time, we've got to have talks, talks, talks. Why? No matter how many times it fails, it's suggested again, and it's celebrated each time it occurs, and then it fails. Why? Because the question is never asked, talks with whom? What is the nature of the other side of the table? What is the nature of Xi Jinping? What is the nature of Vladimir Putin? What is the nature of Mao Zedong? What is the nature of Stalin? What is the nature of all these dictators? That's never considered because the nature of these people is to have risen to power by murder, to have held on to power, including the power to murder, to be in charge of throttling their citizens' dreams and maybe their very lives, almost always their very lives.
Remember when uh, Trump went to North Korea? He didn't say, I can't meet with him. He's got blood on his hands and he's a ruler of a country who holds people on a leash. No, he said, well, we can, you know, work things out. He can understand us and we can understand him. Yeah, we could. We don't have to go talk to him to understand we've got minds. He could understand, and I'm sure he does, that the United States of America still represents the freest state, the freest country in the world, and in its original meaning was the country of individual rights. And he understands that he is a killer whose biggest enemy ideologically is rights. And the, our side could recognize that these are people who wake up each morning worrying that they are going to be killed by either one of their associates who's scrambling for power or in a rebellion against the people he's snuffing out the lives of, the populace. No. The nature of the entity involved is never considered. Why? Because a whole long line of philosophers, starting in ancient Greece and climaxing in the United States in the early 20th century, in John Dewey, has taught there are no absolutes, there is no identity. Things are, have no fixed nature. What was true yesterday will not be true tomorrow. Cause and effect is old fashioned. Things are not anything. They are bits of behavior. You know what Bertrand Russell said a person was or any entity? A time slice of space time. You are a cross section, a time slice in space time. You're like a freeze frame or a series of freeze frames in a movie. So you could do anything. David Hume said, may we not clearly and distinctly conceive that something falling from the clouds and in all other respects resembling snow, yet had the taste of salt and the hotness of fire. And he attacked the idea of secret hidden essences and powers of things. No, things are what they do. They have no identity. They are not really things. The father of all this is the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. Heraclitus is famous for the saying, you can't step in the same river twice, for fresh waters are ever flowing upon you. And in fact, you can be you twice. You're changing all the time. Everything is changed. It's change all the way down. There are no things. There's only process. If that's the case, if that's the metaphysics, then it makes sense not to consider what the guy did yesterday. Yeah, yesterday he slaughtered some people, and this morning he issued edicts to round up his enemies. But that was then. This is now. What prevents someone from making that mistake, can we call it a mistake, that tragic insanity, from committing that tragic insanity, is the understanding, as Ayn Rand said, to exist is to be something. I'm quoting now, as distinguished from the nothing of non-existence. It is to be an entity of a specific nature made of specific attributes. Centuries ago, the man who was, no matter what his errors, the greatest of your philosophers, meaning Aristotle, has stated the formula defining the concept of existence and the rule of all knowledge. A is A. A thing is itself. You have never grasped the meaning of his statement, I am here to complete it. Existence is identity. Consciousness is identification. 
close quote from Atlas Shrugged. The motive of, for not considering entities, the motive for, for swallowing the pragmatist, Heraclitean process philosophy idea that it's all just time slices of changing images, the motive is the desire to get away from moral judgment. It's to be free from what you have done. If nothing is a real entity, if things have no nature, no character, then you are not to blame. That was yesterday's me that did that. I can't be held responsible. This is the time slice today. Quoting again from Atlas Shrugged, the freedom you seek is freedom from the fact that if you stole your wealth, you are a scoundrel, no matter how much you give to charity or how many prayers you recite. That if you sleep with sluts, you're not a worthy husband, no matter how anxiously you feel that you love your wife next morning. That you are an entity, not a series of random pieces scattered through a universe where nothing sticks and nothing commits you to anything. The universe of a child's nightmare where identities switch and swim. That you are a man, that you are an entity, that you are. No matter how eagerly you claim that the goal of your mystic wishing is a higher mode of life, the rebellion against identity is the wish for non-existence. The desire not to be anything is the desire not to be. So yes, there's a venal motive in all these uh, talks and de quiet diplomacy and deal making with murderers. But it's not for money. It's for living a philosophy where you can't be blamed by what you uh, for what you did, that you are not to be judged, that you are not anything in particular. Yeah, you may have done some terrible things, but that was then. So the moral is to be is to be something, is to be an entity made of specific attributes. And that means you do not pretend to yourself that if you just get the head butcher to like you and smile while he shakes your hand, that you've accomplished something. You wouldn't think that if you patted a tiger on the head, that he wouldn't eat you. Because, oh, now he understands me. He understands that my intentions are peaceful. So he will be my friend. A tiger is a tiger. A killer is a killer. A dictator is a killer on a nationwide scale. There should be no international organization of uh, free nations and slave states together in, in any kind of dancing around, talking. There should be no diplomacy. There should be no, the only communication that sh there should be with the dictator is the one that says, get your citizens out of X because in 24 hours, the bombs are going to fall. And that is a nice, probably two nice things to do. So ultimata, that is the only form of community. And you don't listen to what they say in response. You wouldn't listen to what Hitler says. Why would you listen to the equivalent North Korea, North Korea, China, the Soviet Union, the present Russian Federation, Cuba, any of these places that are dictatorships and hate individual rights hate life and want to destroy we have one question she is not on hitler's level he didn't declare war on us not saying biden should ever interact with it, but it's a false equivalency it's not a false equivalency would you say that um a person who's killed one individual 
cannot be equilibrated with the person who's killed 10? Or the person who's killed 10 can't be equivalent to a person who's killed 100,000? To kill one person is to make yourself a beast of prey who should be killed. Now, there's that's not to necessarily go along with capital punishment because you may have the government may have made a mistake as they have many times in the past. But morally, anyone who kills one person deserves to die. So there are no degrees of evil once you reach the level of murder. And whether he declared war on us or not, he's declared war on his own citizens. 